Well, good morning, everybody. It is great to see you. So I discovered something this morning. Uh, I was walking backstage here past the room where uh, the team are back there sort of making sure that the cameras are working and they're uh, sort of doing the video directing for the screens that we have in the worship center and also for the online feed. And as I walked past, I heard the expression, we have a Tom and Megan situation. I did not know what a Tom and Megan situation meant, and then they let me know that John and Katie Ganan were creating a Tom and Megan situation where you have two people that you need to get on screen at once, but there is a height discrepancy. All I'm saying is Megan refuses to stand on the phone book. That's all I'm saying. But um, we're, we're, uh, there's a, there's a uh, okay, I have a moment of shame. Uh, we do have an opportunity to fundraise for Speed the Light today. It involves a bucket where if you throw the ball and you get it accurately, the bucket will dump the contents on top of a person. Um, I was asked if I would be one of the people. They didn't just want to put water in the bucket. So I'm not going to be in the chair, but I've been shamed and guilted into saying I will do it next time, pinky promise. So, come check that out today, and then we will definitely be doing it again because I am now morally and guilted and obligated to do it another time. But, uh, youth retreat last weekend, I had a great time. I was able to go. I went with Elijah, uh, make sure that he had a great time, and the truth is, Elijah is just my excuse to be able to go. I love going to youth retreat. Um, here at the church, we have a great group of, of students. We have a great group of teens, um, high school and middle school students. They really are a great group, um, and we do a few retreats throughout the year, and I'll say to you, if you're a parent, and your teen is kind of like uncertain about going away and not too sure about all these kind of things. Um, I totally understand that. I'd encourage you, go ahead, take a moment, talk to Pastor Annie, go to the info desk, find a little bit more about it um, because it is a fantastic time away and there are great stories that continue to come from the families of students that uh, did go ahead and get away this past weekend. And Elijah and I are definitely excited for the fall retreat coming up uh, into October. But we're going to be continuing today in Psalm 23. This is the summer series, and Psalm 23, we've uh, kind of looked at it, we've kind of broken it up into a, a few different chunks and a few different topics that we'll take together. And so we're going to walk through this uh, over the summer into September. And King David is who wrote the psalm, and last week, the theme that Megan preached on as she started the series was the opening line that the Lord is my shepherd. And so we're going to read the whole psalm together, and then we'll consider the promise that God, the good shepherd, that he leads us to rest. And we're going to look at why this whole concept of rest is important and how it affects every area of our lives. So we're going to be in Psalm 23. I decided to read from the New King James Version today. So Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of the righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And today, from all the different things that we could take from this psalm, and we'll be going through these over the next number of weeks, but today we're going to look at this whole idea of rest. And what came to my mind, and I'm sure it's no coincidence that I just came back from youth retreat, is when I was first youth pastoring and I went on my first summer camp, I was complaining to another youth pastor about the lack of sleep. And the youth pastor kind of looked at me and like, funny, like, do you mean you don't know? I was like, know what? He's like, oh, you got to know. I was like, know what? He's like, you really don't know? I was like, know what? He said, dude, everybody knows. Know what? He's like, when you come away for a youth camp and you're away for like a week, night one, you let the students stay up as late as they want. If it's two o'clock, fine. If it's five o'clock, fine. Let them stay up as late as they want because then every night afterwards, they're going to be exhausted and you'll get all the sleep you can ever dream of. That is some of the best advice I have ever got, and I can say it is true. It is true. Now, it's the whole idea of rest and this whole idea of, you know, busyness. It's no surprise, and I don't think anybody here would object or argue that um, we are in a busy culture. 
Most of us are swept up in the same busyness as everyone else, and I'm sure that many, and possibly most of you, you feel the pressure to, of being busy and being stretched too thin, and even more shocking, feeling like that is normal. You feel overextended and burning out, but your schedule looks a lot like everyone else's. There's a friend of mine in the area, another pastor, and he was saying to me one time as we were catching up that if he asked somebody how they're doing and if their response is busy, he insists on asking more. Like, well, okay, I get that you're busy, but everyone's busy. That's not an answer. I mean, how are you? And it, because this idea of busy is just so commonplace that it, it, it doesn't even stand out. It's like, I'm busy. Well, everyone's busy. So, okay, how else are you doing? And there's all kinds of statistics around this. And they all paint the same picture. One researcher found that 80% of people describe themselves as too busy. Another researcher concluded that six out of 10 people said they were too busy to enjoy life. Six out of 10 people, 60% of people are too busy to enjoy life. Now there are many different ways that followers of Jesus will be different than the general drift of culture. We know this and realize that this is a part of the life of faith. We understand that our life of faith will mean that we are set apart. We typically think that this whole idea about being set apart, it applies to issues of morality or ethics or conduct. But if you spend time reading the Bible, this whole idea of rest or Sabbath is far more common than we might realize. And this whole idea of rest and this whole idea of Sabbath, it stands in direct contrast to what is typical and normal. This line from the Psalm again, he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. The world doesn't lead us to rest. The world doesn't lead us to peaceful streams. The world leads us to stress and the demand and pressure of more and more. The world will eat up our time and effort without us even thinking about it. The world will guilt and obligate us into more and more responsibilities and commitments. And before we even realize it, we're a part of the 60% that would say we're too busy to enjoy life. The Lord knew all about this. He gave his people the, the gift of Sabbath. For the Old Testament people, the Sabbath meant every sundown on Friday evening until Saturday evening, and it was to be a time of complete rest. Interestingly, this is part of the reason that there was um, an unmendable friction between the Roman Empire and the Jewish people that they were sort of overseeing as their overlords. Because the Roman Empire, they would go to different countries all around the world, and they would say, you are now part of the Roman Empire, and part of your country or your people now being a part of the Roman Empire is that the Romans could conscript you to the military. They couldn't conscript the Jewish men to the military because every Saturday, they needed a day off. And that didn't work in the Roman military. And that's part of the explanation why there's this sort of, this incredible friction, this incredible hostility between the Romans and the Jewish people at the time of Jesus. The origin of the Sabbath was before the Ten Commandments. God gave a group of newly freed slaves a day off a week. The Egyptian slave drivers did not give the slaves a day off. This was a gift from God. Can you imagine how grateful and relieved the ancient Israelites would have been to hear that after 400 years of slavery for them and their ancestors, they're now getting a day off. Not just once, but every seven days. It's from the book of Exodus. They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. Later on, the Ten Commandments would include the requirement to observe the Sabbath, to, to observe the weekly day off. And by the time of Jesus, the Sabbath had become for some a, a demand to be upheld rather than a gift to enjoy. The religious leaders, they took it upon themselves to be the enforcers of how everyone behaved on the Sabbath and made sure that no one did anything that could be defined as work. What should have been restful and a gift to be enjoyed became a religious burden. Somehow they turned a day off into hard work. This becomes a constant theme in the Gospels as Jesus corrects the faulty approach people had this is from Mark's gospel. And then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people. The Sabbath was made, the Sabbath was given as a gift to give you a chance to rest and refresh. And it was not so that people can meet the requirements of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not given just so that you could uphold some pointless law. It was given as a blessing and as a gift. This is Jesus straightening out people's thinking about rest, specifically the Sabbath. The command to rest is a gift, not a frustration. It's a blessing, not a demand. Now the biblical concept of rest, it will mean that the to-do list will be put on pause. 
Many of the things that are demanding our time will be ignored. But the refreshing and the recuperation we gain from a healthy amount of rest will ensure that we are more effective and productive than if we just go, go, go. Now, David, he was both a shepherd and a sheep. He was a literal shepherd, and as Megan shared last week, he was a king who understood that his role was to be a shepherd to the nation as he became a king. But he also recognizes that he is a metaphorical sheep as he followed God, and he viewed God as the shepherd. And there's a book that a number of the staff are reading right now as we're preparing for this series. Um, It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. So that's the book cover there. This is a wonderful book, I believe, the guys from New Zealand, um, and the sheep in New Zealand outnumber people four to one. And uh, so he is a shepherd that sort of reflected upon this psalm and wrote that book. It's really worth a read. Um, But a few things from that book that as I was uh, checking that out this week, it taught me something about sheep that I didn't know and consequently about rest. The first thing is that sheep don't rest until they feel safe. Sheep don't rest until they feel safe. Sheep won't rest until the circumstances are right. And this guy, the author, the shepherd, he used the example of one jackrabbit can disturb a whole herd of sheep. The sheep, they need to feel safe and secure. And as I was reading about that and thinking about that, I have my own example of this, and I'm guessing you do as well. Before I go to bed in the evening, I go out and make sure that the garage door is closed. On my way back into the house, I deadbolt the door that connects the garage to the house. I go to the front door, and I get the deadbolt. And then I go to the back door, and I make sure the kids haven't left it open or letting bugs in. That's essentially the same thing here. There's a sense of we've got to make sure that things are safe in the house before we rest. And the sheep, as we learn from the shepherd, that same idea. And consequently, as a shepherd, there's a responsibility to bring the sheep to a place of safety so they can rest. The shepherd has a responsibility to make sure that the sheep are safe so they can rest. Psalm 22, uh, 23, 2 again, he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. We can lean on the safety and security we find in our faith. It is right and appropriate that our confidence is in him. As I was reflecting on this week, I came up with a number of Bible verses, and there's many, many more I could have shared with you today. But these really do underline this idea that God is in control. It is right that we feel safe with him. It is right that our confidence is in him and our trust is in him. From the book of Isaiah, only I can tell you the future before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. From the book of Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. From Psalm 37, Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Later in Psalm 37, for the Lord loves justice, and he will never abandon the godly. He will keep them safe forever. And Jesus' teaching in Matthew 7, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the wind beats against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rains and floods come and the wind beats against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. But with Jesus, building our life on him, it is right, it is appropriate, it is rational that we have a confidence and we feel safe. And that feeling of safety is key to getting the rest that the Lord wants us to have. Another thought that came to me as I was reflecting on all this and preparing for this morning is that a shepherd would only get paid and the shepherd would only get to keep their job if he's good at protecting the sheep. And if God is indeed the good shepherd and he is pointing to himself and saying, I am like a shepherd and a shepherd needs to be good and effective at keeping the sheep safe, it tells us something about the motive and the heart of God. That he is, it is right, it is appropriate that we feel secure with him. Even if things are out of control and the battle is raging. And as we read from the words of Jesus, the winds and the storm is coming, a beating against the house. We can stand strong and we can stand firm because he is still on the throne and he is still in control. The second thing is that sheep will eat anything. Sheep will eat anything. If there's no grass to feed on. The sheep will eat whatever they can find, weeds, bushes, brambles. According to the shepherd, they will eat anything. They'll try and sustain themselves on things that aren't healthy. Unless we're given an alternative, 
we will likewise find ourselves trying to survive and feed on things that won't help. You can fill in the blank with whatever that might be for you. It didn't take much self-reflection for me to see myself where I try to live and survive and be fueled by things that don't have much value and are ultimately unhealthy. It's easy for me to observe where I try and fuel my life with unhealthy things that have no eternal value and cause me to drift from my relationship with God. And one thing I was thinking about as I was getting ready and thinking about myself is uh, I'm a picky eater. For a 40-year-old man, um, I would admit that I am a picky eater, so much so that about 10 years ago, I decided I'm not trying any more new food. I decided that right now for the rest of my life, I'm just on repeats. I'm not trying any more near food. Now, despite that, I have somewhat of an irrational fear, and it is irrational. I have an irrational fear that I'm going to be marooned on a desert island, and I'll have to eat gross stuff. I think about this way more than I should. But if you've ever seen the movie Castaway or the TV show Lost, um, if I was in that position and I needed to eat things that they had to eat, um, it would not be a good time. Um, there is definitely, however, a point that I would be so hungry that I would eat weird fish or I would turn bugs into a cheeseburger or whatever. There is a point where we're hungry enough that we would eat something unthinkable just to survive. Now, the unfortunate truth is that we're all so spiritually hungry and we're all eating whatever we think might help. And the promise of Jesus, the good shepherd, that leading us into rest where we can eat and be fueled and sustained by good and healthy food. It's a picture, it's an analogy of what he does for us spiritually. And this leads me to the next thing, is that sheep need to know the way. This is another part of Jesus' teaching from Matthew 9. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, I've lost count of how many times I've referenced the movie Jesus Revolution on a Sunday morning. Um, it continues to move me, continues to inspire me. Um, the movie is set in 1969. And there's a scene where a young hippie street preacher is talking to a boring old pastor of a small church. And he's explaining a perspective on the hippies to a pastor who's confused by it all. And the street preacher, Lonnie Frisbee, he says that the drugs, the hippie movement, it's a quest for God. That there's an entire generation searching for God. What's done so well in the film is that this conversation, it cuts between the two men, these two preachers talking at the kitchen table, and it keeps cutting to a group of high schoolers at a festival somewhere in California. And at this festival, the hippie thought leader, Timothy Leary, he makes wild promises to the crowd of impressionable teens. He tells them the wonders and the merits of LSD and free love. And as all this is happening at the festival, we keep cutting back to the kitchen table where two followers of Jesus realize that all these young people are searching, but they need a shepherd to show them the way. My friends, is there any argument that we're a part of a generation where people are searching for what only God can give? And we're alive in a generation that is lost and trying to be found. We're a part of a generation that is afraid and wants to feel safe. We're a part of a generation that feels lonely and wants to be loved and appreciated. We're a part of a generation that questions their value and they need to know that they are created in the image of God. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. My friends, the sheep need to know the way. Sheep don't rest until they feel safe. Sheep will eat anything, and sheep need to know the way. It's as true for literal sheep as it is for us. From this psalm and the promise of rest, I have a few thoughts for what this means for us as 21st century Americans. The first thing I would say about all this is that rest requires trust. Rest requires trust. Until just a few hundred years ago, the entire world was driven by an agrarian economy. Farmers understand something about God's provision that many of us don't. For instance, I worked in retail, and if I have a day off, someone else just comes and works the shift after me. If the office is closed for the weekend, then everything just waits until Monday. But for a farmer, for people whose survival depends on tending to the farmland, taking a day off a week requires trust. Farmers understand that when they're praying for rain, they need 
rain. If they're praying for sun, they need sun. And they understand if I take a day off from tending to the land or tending to the livestock, there's a chance this is not going to go as well for me as if I were able to take care of them, were able to keep working. It requires trust to step away. One day a week works out to be 14.2% of the week. If you're wondering, I used a calculator. I did not work that out. 14.2% of the week. And to have a farmer step away for 14.2% of the week and just trust that in his absence, not tending to the land, not, you know, beyond feeding the animals, it's still believing the Lord is at work. That takes trust. It's a call to trust. In The Chosen, the TV show, it retells the story of the Gospels. And in the show, they add a lot of fictional background stories to help us understand first century life. And there are scenes of Peter and Andrew, the fishermen, and they're arguing about whether they should fish on the Sabbath because the extra fish would give them some financial breathing room. But the enjoying of the Sabbath and and embracing the Sabbath, it's a call to trust because taking a day off means trusting God to come through. Jesus teaching again in Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? I've seen a lot of people in my time tattoo Bible verses on themselves. I think it would be pretty good to tattoo this one on a lot of people. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Rest requires trust. Next thing I would say as I was thinking about this and what it means for us today is that rest is not the enemy of your responsibilities. Rest is not the enemy of your responsibilities. In 1956, the best Western that was ever made starring John Wayne hit theaters and The Searchers was released. Anybody seen the movie The Searchers? Oh, wow, we've got people clapping for The Searchers, okay. It's a, if, you like, if you like cowboy movies, it's a good one. So The Searchers, there's a scene towards the beginning of the movie where John Wayne, uh, he's 40 miles away from home, and he gets word that there's been a problem back at the ranch. And so he's got to get back to the ranch as soon as possible because people are in danger. And one of the young guys that there is a bit of a hothead. He just jumps on his horse after a full day's travel and takes off for home. And John Wayne tells him, don't go. The horses need to rest. The horses need to eat. You cannot get there. You've got to travel 40 miles, which I looked this up, is about six hours on horseback. You can't ride this horse for another six hours. They've got to rest. But this young hothead, no, no, no. I've got to go. Got to go. Got to go. So the young hothead takes off. The next scene, you see John Wayne sitting down, kicking back, letting the horse rest and feed and get water and all the rest of it. And then the next thing you know, he is booking it in the desert past this guy whose horse has collapsed miles away from home. Rest is not the enemy of your responsibilities. Rest is a way to be able to go into these things, bring in your best self instead of your worn out leftovers. A great quote from Abraham Lincoln. If I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I would spend six hours sharpening the ax. In all the conversation around rest, there can be no doubt that the answer is not just be lazy. We all get this. The same Bible that gives us commands to rest, it also says this in the book of Proverbs, that, but you, lazy bones, how will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. So if burning yourself out is not the answer, and being a lazy slob is not the answer, 
is the right approach to find some kind of balance in the middle? As I was thinking about this and weighing it up, I'm inclined to say that the best approach is not to try and strike a balance, but rather to embrace both extremes. When it's time to work, give it your best. Show up, go above what's asked of you. Make an effort, don't phone it in. Make sure your boss is glad you're on the team. And when it's your day off, take a day off. Leave the emails alone, leave it until Monday. Give your spouse and your kids your attention. Discipline yourself to turn off work. Turn your phone off and find out that the world isn't going to end because you're not at the world's beck and call. <laughs> Take care of your responsibilities. Be vigilant and careful. Fulfill your obligations. If you've said yes to something, give it your best. But if this is a time to rest, if you've planned time to rest, guard it with jealousy. Enjoy it. Thank God for it. Let things wait. And when you've rested, when you're refreshed, get going. Rest invites God's strengthening and God's blessing. So go and work hard. Give it your best. I believe the biblical model is to go above and beyond when it's time to work and to enjoy and look forward to and protect your time to rest. Unless we forget, God presents himself as a role model. As he's giving the, the command to have a Sabbath, to have a day off, to rest, to enjoy this gift of rest, he points to himself and says, I made the world in six days, and then I took a day off to rest. And if God points to himself as the role model, that should inspire some confidence within us. The next thing I was put to you is that rest is a gift to take care of. Now, I'm not a car guy. Um, if somebody asks me what my dream car is, the only answer I have is something reliable. That's all I got. But I know that some people, they have like a dream car that one day they hope they're able to get. Now imagine you were able to get that dream car. You already know because we know what a car is like to have. It also comes with a set of responsibilities. You have to take care of a vehicle. It needs to be maintained. You need to change oil. It needs to go through inspection every year. It needs to get insurance. And, you know, all these things. We understand this. It doesn't make it less of a gift because it comes with some responsibilities because now we have to take care of this gift. It's still a gift even though it's something we have to care for. I would say the same thing is true about the gift of rest, is that it's something that we have to take care of and we have to guard and we have to be careful of and we have to tend to, otherwise it will slip away. Time to rest and recuperate, it'll become more time just scrolling through our phone or answering emails or text or allowing others to eat our time. We should value and protect this gift. Don't give it up. Don't be pressured into letting it all slip away. Rest is important, it's a gift. It's something God cares about so much that he commanded it. Please don't undervalue it and miss out. Rest requires trust. Rest is not the enemy of your responsibilities, and rest is a gift to take care of. I'm trying to make sense of this and trying to present this message to you, and of course there's a lot more that could be said than I'm going to be saying today. But I try to think of a few different ways that rest shows itself in our lives. And the first kind of rest I thought of, I just simply called practical. This is the obvious kind of rest. I read a worthwhile question this week. Is it why is sleeping in considered lazy, but going to bed early is called responsible? I don't have an answer. But rest is a precious gift to take care of. Get the sleep you need. Have time for hobbies. Resist the pressure to be a slave to the normal level of busyness. Explain to your kids that your family won't be loading up the calendar the way that their friends might. Make catching your breath a priority. Agree with your spouse what you're going to commit to and decide that you're going to make rest a key part of your week. I would also say there's mental rest, where it would be healthy and important to get some distance between you and the stressful things in your life. Turn off the phone, spend time away from the news, figure out what's causing frustration and plan time removed from wherever it is. I would also say there's relational rest. Take time with people you love and do something you want without trying to achieve anything. I went to a Mets game with Moses on Friday and I achieved nothing, but it was priceless time with my son. And the Mets won 13 to do and scored nine innings in the fifth inning. It was a good time. One of my favorite things to do with the family is to have movie night, and I'm 100% certain that 30 years from now, I'll be reminiscing about the times we sat down to watch Diary of a Wimpy Kid with Esther snuggled up on my lap. Any time I get to hang out with Megan for lunch or dinner or coffee is refreshing. The people you love the most deserve to spend significant time relaxing with you. 
I will say that again because it hit me like a brick. The people you love the most deserve to spend significant time relaxing with you. What are the peaceful streams that David wrote about for you and those closest to you? The image of a peaceful stream, it gives this idea of relaxing and calm and peace. Find that kind of rest for you and your family. And then, of course, there's spiritual rest, time to worship and pray and read the Bible as a way of decompressing. Remind yourself of the goodness and majesty and sovereignty of God. Take time and reflect and remember and gain a new perspective. Listen for a fresh word. Rest because He is worthy. Rest because He knows the beginning from the end. Rest because He has overcome the world. Rest because your life is built on the rock, on His teaching, and when the storm comes, you're still standing. And this requires trust. To let the to-do list go unattended for a day, to take time to refresh and fresh and rest and catch up on sleep, it means trusting the Lord with all of it. It took the ancient Israelites' trust. It took farmers' trust, just like it does for you and I. This means being careful of your calendar and not overloading yourself. It means saying no. It might even mean disappointing the kids, or worse yet, upsetting the kids' coach. You don't need to justify or explain your need to find rest. Pray for rest, plan for rest, look forward to rest, prioritize rest. And then, after a good night's sleep, a chance to be with your family, time with the Lord, get up with a spring in your step and go and take care of all that's in front of you stronger than ever. Face your challenges, advance in your calling as someone strong and invigorated, not someone that's worn out and gasping for air. You're not lazy because you're rested. You're stronger, more focused, and you're bringing your best instead of your left out leftovers. I mentioned in the beginning that when we think about Christians being set apart and Christians being different than the world around us, we typically will think of issues of morality or we think of things of ethics, things of conduct. And of course, that's true. But I would also say this is probably an undervalued way that as believers, we should be different than the world around us. The world around us, as I mentioned, 80% of people said they're too busy, 60%. I'm so busy, I can't enjoy life. This is one of the ways that we should be different. We should be different. It's all throughout the scriptures. Enjoy the Sabbath. Have a Sabbath. It's a gift from God. It's so important that the Lord, you need to do this. You need to rest so that you can go into life strong and not worn out. When we think about being set apart, when we think about being different because we're committed to following Jesus, of course that involves issues of morality and how we navigate life and our sense of values and so on. Of course, I'm not belittling that, but I also just want to bring this into the spotlight for today and say this is another way we should be different. Others may pack their calendar with beyond any sense of breathing room. Others may pack their schedule so full that they don't have a chance to catch their breath. Others may pack their schedule so tight that they find themselves double booking themselves all the time. That may be what is normal, but we're going to resist that as the people of God. And we're going to say, God, I trust you with what you're doing in my life. I trust that you will take care of things. I trust that me and my family, we don't need to be go, go, go all the time. Instead, we're going to, tr- we're going to relax and we're going to rest together. And we're going to go through life stronger because we prioritized you and we've taken your word that we want us to rest seriously. And we've made it a priority and we planned for it and we prayed for it and we prioritized and we've guarded it jealously because we've done that we're going through life stronger sheep don't rest until they feel safe sheep will eat anything and sheep need to know the way my friends with all that in mind this tells us something about how the church should be if sheep don't rest until they feel safe the church needs to be a place of safety If sheep will eat anything, then the church needs to serve up good food. If sheep need to know the way, the church needs to be committed to showing people the way. Rest requires trust. Rest is not the enemy of your responsibilities. And rest is a gift to take care of. I have a couple of questions for you. If you may be in the habit of writing these down so you can reflect on this this week or pray about them or talk about them with someone you trust. But the first question I'd put to you, do you trust the Lord enough to rest? Do you trust the Lord enough to rest? And the second question I'd put to you, what's making healthy rest difficult for you? What's making healthy rest difficult for you? 
a verse that I've shared with the church many, many times over the past couple of years. Matthew 11, 28. If you didn't see it coming that I was going to be reading this verse today, welcome to Word of Life. I'm glad you're here. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. This invitation from Jesus, it still stands. The invitation to come to me. And this invitation, it's made to weary people. And it's important to remember that you don't get weary because you've had a busy weekend. You don't get weary because you've had a crazy day at work. You become weary because you've been carrying too much for too long. And Jesus gives us the promise of rest. He gives us the chance to take his yoke. And a yoke would be used to harness two animals together normally so they could pull a plow or something heavy behind them. But this is a way that you would partner two animals together. So as Jesus invites us to take his yoke upon us, it's him saying, be partnered with me. Partner your life. Pair your life with me. Go through life in lockstep with me. Go through life in partnership with me. And that he will teach us. He will teach us. And he is not proud. He is not angry like so many voices in the world. But instead of being proud and angry, he's humble and gentle by following him by accepting His invitation, by partnering with Him, by letting Him teach us that we will find rest for our souls. I invite you to stand with me for a moment. As I've shared today this whole idea of rest and finally sharing this promise from Jesus that in Him we can find rest for our souls, I hope that for every believer here, that has been your experience as you've said yes to Jesus that you have found rest for your soul. And you may be here now and you may have never responded to the message of Jesus. You may have never made that decision that you're gonna follow Jesus. You're gonna commit to him. You're gonna commit to following Jesus. And you may be here in this idea of rest for your soul. I may be speaking your language today. I may be hitting right on what you're crying out for, a sense of rest for your soul. And my friend, I'm glad you're here. You may have been in church every Sunday your whole life, or you may have never set foot in a church building before, but this is the Sunday that you're in church listening to this message on the whole idea of finding rest for your soul. And if that's what you need, Jesus promised. Tom Wood didn't promise. Word of Life didn't promise. Jesus promised in Him, you can find rest for your soul. I'm going to pray a prayer in just a moment. And when I do, I want you to, Really consider whether you're ready to make that decision to follow Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, if you believe that he is indeed the Son of God who came to earth motivated by a love for humanity so that the sin, the list of regrets that each of us have, those things that separate us from God, that he can overcome those, he can forgive those, and that he can bring us back together. He can reconcile a broken relationship with God. He can bring us back into community with our Creator. If you believe that Jesus went to the cross for you and for me, that he died even though he was sinless and he took on the sin of the world so that we could have forgiveness. And three days later on that first Easter Sunday, he rose from the grave conquering the power of sin and death once and for all. My friend, if you believe this, you are ready to follow Jesus and there's not a single excuse in the world to keep you from going except you need to, this today is the day where you make that decision and you follow him with everything. So if this is you today, I want to invite everyone here to close your eyes and bow your heads. This is just to give some discretion to everyone around you. But if you would say in a moment of honesty, Tom, I'm, I'm not following Jesus, but I want to start. I'd love to pray for you. And if that's you today, if you just put your hand up just so I know who we're praying for when we pray together in just a moment, that would be awesome. We're going to pray here in just a moment. We don't need to do anything to embarrass anybody, but if you want to be included in this prayer, just put your hand up. I'd love to know who I'm praying for this morning. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else here today? 
Amen. Word of life, can we please celebrate for those people making that great decision this morning? Amen. We do this at the end of every service, and we're going to pray a prayer together. And I want to invite everyone here to pray this, believing that there is power in a prayer like this. So come on, everyone, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. I want to follow you. I invite you to be Lord of my life. Help me follow you every day. I want to leave my old life of sin behind and heal my broken relationship with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, one more time, quickly celebrate with those people making that decision. Amen. We're going to go back into a time of worship. I want to invite the prayer team to come down front. And if you're one of those people that put your hand up a moment ago, I want to invite you to come down, speak to one of these prayer team members and say, hey, when that British guy was talking, I put my hand up and this is why. They'd love to talk to you. They'd love to pray with you. And if you've got anything going on at all, that you want someone to stand in agreement in prayer with you, come down. The prayer team would love to spend some time. If you're just carrying a burden, don't leave here without lifting it back up to the Lord. Don't leave here still feeling like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. Come down, receive prayer. They'd love to spend some time with you. But let's go ahead. Let's spend some time in worship together. Amen.